Thank you all for coming out tonight. I was going to start out this lesson on decision making by listing off all of the decisions I make in a day. And I got to the point where I put my feet on the ground as I was thinking in my head. And the list was already super long and super boring. So I'm not going to subject you guys to all of that. Uh, we make thousands of decisions every day. Uh, most of them are inconsequential and not impactful in our lives. Um, some of them we want to get back sometimes, like what tuxedo to wear when you're a sophomore in high school, like uh, young me made. Uh, and I mean, most of the decisions I made at that time I'd probably like to get back, but this one in particular as it lives on in picture form. Um, so, <laughs> If you want to get better at making decisions, you can maybe read a book. There are quite a few of them. I did an Amazon search, and there are over 60,000 books when you type in decision making. The top four, uh, you could do How to Decide by Annie Duke, Simple Tools for Making Better Choices, On Making Smart Decisions, which is a Harvard Business Review joint. Uh, those are always great. Uh, thinking Fast and Slow, if you are into Nobel Prize winners and what they have to say, and I guess they chew on pencils as well, but you can, you can learn about that from them. Or if you're in for a real page turner, you can get the third edition of the Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making, which sounds particularly awesome. We can learn from a lot of people in how to make these simple decisions in our lives, but how do we figure out how to make the spiritual decisions in our life. Let's go ahead and turn to Acts 1, and we're going to read verses 12 through 26, and it's the account of the choosing of Matthias. Usually when I go through Acts 1, I go through pretty quick so I can get to Acts 2, especially at this point. I don't really ever take a bunch of time on this passage here, so I decided to dive it into it into it a little bit and came across uh, a few things in the way they made decisions, and I'll share those with you tonight. So let's go ahead and read Acts 1, verses 12 through 26. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in his ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Actel Dama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in his ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and, they, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. So what can we learn in how to make spiritual decisions from the choosing of Matthias? First off, we learn that we need to take action. In verse 15, Peter steps up and brings it up with the others that this needed to be done at this time. So what can stop little old us from doing what we need to do in our spiritual life? Well, I'll, I'll get a little nerdy for a second. Not Bible nerdy, but a little normal nerdy. I took one psychology class in college, and this is the only thing I remember from that class. And it's called the bystander effect. The bystander effect, or bystander apathy, is a social psychological theory that states that individuals are less likely to offer help to a victim when there are other people present. So what does that mean for us? I know we're not in a, an emergency situation in most of our spiritual lives, as in no one's physically dying, 
uh, around us. Uh, but part of this is the diffusion of responsibility. I promise this is the, the most nerdy thing I'll do, so just bear with me here. The diffusion of responsibility refers to the decreased responsibility of action each member of a group feels when they are part of a group. Assumption of responsibility tends to decrease when the potential helping group is larger, resulting in little aiding behavior demonstrated by the bystander. So the more people that are around, the less responsible you feel when a decision needs to be made or when something needs to be done. We're blessed with a great group that's growing, but if we were in a group of five, maybe you would feel one-fifth responsible for what we have to do here. When we're in a group of 150, you maybe feel 150th responsible for what we have to do here, which, I mean, 150th is not all that responsible, so it's pretty much nothing. So let's just let someone else take care of it. And I also find it interesting that in the group that they're talking about with Peter, it's about 120 people, and our number today was 128. So that's a, just a comment to the side. So we're less likely to do the things that we need to do because we're in a growing group. So how do we stop this? James 2, 14 through 17 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed, lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things they need for the body, what good is that? So also by faith itself, if it does not have works, is dead. We need to act. It's not enough just to have faith. One example of this comes from Acts 18. I'm going to read verses 24 through 28, and this is the account of Priscilla and Aquila correcting Apollos. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only of the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. They saw that he was teaching something that was incorrect. So they took him aside and they corrected it. It didn't say they talked amongst themselves, they went to their friends, and were like, do you hear what Apollos is saying? This is terrible. Let's, let's just not listen to him. They, the next words when it said they heard him say something contrary to God's word, they corrected him. There was no space in between. There's no filler words. There's nothing. It's this and then that. And that's a lesson that we can learn from that. They didn't wait. James 4.17 says, whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So what now? What does this mean for us? If you see something that needs done, it's now your job to do it. You can't stop at just pointing it out or talking about it. You have to dive in and do these things. You can't go to somebody else and say, hey, um, I think this needs to be done. If you see something that needs done, just do it. The next thing we can learn from this account is that we need to gain knowledge. Acts 1.20, Peter knew it was God's plan to replace Judas, and he knew the type of person that needed to fill that role. Proverbs 19.2 says, Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. It doesn't do us much good to want to do the right thing if we don't know what the right thing to do is. We have to dive into God's word and learn that before we can actually go forward and do that. I'm going to read an example from 2 Kings chapters 22 and 23. All the scriptures are going to be on here, but it's going to be kind of small. So if you have trouble seeing what's up here, you may want to follow along in your Bible. This is the account of King Josiah when he learned about the law and that the Jewish people weren't doing what they should have been doing in regards to the law. Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the temple of the Lord, which 
as a high priest, probably should he should probably be a little more excited than than he was here. He's like, I found this book. Here, here you go. Um, he gave it to Shaphan, who read it. Then Shaphan the secretary went to the king and reported to him, Your officials have paid out the money that was in the temple of the Lord and have entrusted it to the workers and supervisors at the temple. Then Shaphan the secretary informed the, ki- the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. He gave these orders to Hilkiah the priest, Hakim the son of Shaphan, Akbar the son of of Micaiah, Shaphan the secretary, and Isaiah the king's attendant, go and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah about what is written in this book and what has been found. Great is the Lord's anger that burns against us because those who have gone before us have not obeyed the words of this book. They have not acted in accordance with all that is written concerning us. King Josiah learns about the law and tears his clothes because of how upset he was, knowing that they are God's people and they weren't doing what God wanted them to do. And what does he do? He immediately seeks more knowledge. He figures this out, and he wants to know what the Lord thinks about this. So now I'm going to go ahead and read verses 14 through 20. Hilkiah the priest, Ahakam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Isaiah went to speak to the prophet Huldah, who is the wife of Shalom, son of Tikvah, the son of Harhes, keeper of the wardrobe. She lived in Jerusalem in the new quarter. She said to them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Tell the men who sent you to me, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on this place and its people, according to everything written in the book the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and burned incense to other gods and aroused my anger by all the idols their hands have made, my anger will burn against this place and will not be quenched. Tell the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the words you heard. Because your heart was responsive, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I have spoken against this place and its people, that they would become a curse and be laid waste, and because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you will be buried in peace." Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. So here they learn what God actually thinks about the situation. And they learn that Josiah's reaction saves them here. He humbled himself. His heart was responsive. And God was compassionate on him and on the people because of that. Continuing on to chapter 23, verses 1 through 3. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in the hearing all the words of the book of the covenant which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. King Josiah doesn't stop at just knowing and seeing it. He brings all the people together of Israel and commits himself, and I I won't say he makes the people commit themselves as well, but I'm sure he's got a little bit of influence as king. And they decide to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord and to clean up what they've been doing in the temple and for God. And we're not going to read it here, but the rest of chapter 23 is the account of them going through. And if you want to see what they did, you can continue on and read that. So what now? What does this mean for us? We have to read God's word. We need to know the scripture to pro- properly fulfill the will of God and to guide us in our lives. We have to gain knowledge to understand what to do and grow in wisdom to understand how to do it and when to do it. And we need to analyze the situations we're in to actually apply the knowledge that we receive. It would have done Josiah and the Israelites no good if they found the book of the law and just was like, yeah, this is a crazy book. All right, let's continue on with what we're doing. So you have to apply what you learn for it to actually do any good. Next, we need to bring others in. Peter didn't just make this decision on his own. In Acts 1, whenever he brings it up, as soon as he brings it up and says, hey, we need to do this, 
All of the language after that shifts to they, the group. They prayed to God. They brought in people that could fulfill this requirement to cast lots, and then they uh, casted lots and let God choose between them. So I'm going to read Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, I'm probably not going to line up to cuddle with any of you, um, but the, the message holds true. It says that with other people, we are more effective in the work we do uh, in any situation, but specifically for God. We're safer with other people around us, and we're stronger with other people around us. One, I'm going to bring up two examples of this from the Bible. They're very, um, I think, common stories that, that you probably know, um, and not really stories. The first one is Colossians 4, 7 through 14, um, I guess two people that you know well. This is uh, Paul, and you get a lot of great wisdom from these parts of the Bible. This is the final greeting section of Colossians. So when you think of all the lessons you learn in Colossians, I'm sure final greetings comes to uh, mind first. Uh, verses 7 through 14. Tychicus will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I've sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus, Mark, Justice, I'm running out of fingers, Epaphras, Luke, and Demas are all mentioned by name by Paul in this book. And I'm guessing this list is not exhaustive of all the people helping Paul. Even Paul needed help. This is a guy that's specifically chosen by God, and he doesn't seem too shaken up about actually receiving that help. He knows that this is God's plan. He knows that to spread God's word, he needs the help, and he is not afraid to ask for help, and he's not afraid to accept that help. And um, as great of an apostle as, as Paul was, he is someone that accepted that help and, and definitely needed it. The next example I have is of another guy you've probably heard of, and that is Moses. And it comes from Exodus 18, 13 through 26. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. The next day Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood around Moses from morning till evening. When Moses' father-in-law saw all that he was doing for the people, he said, What is it that you are doing for the people? Why do you sit alone and all the people stand around you from morning till evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a dispute, they come to me, and I decide between one person and another, and I make them know the statutes and God, of God and his laws. Moses' father-in-law said to him, What you are doing is not good. You and the people with you will certainly wear yourselves out, for this thing is too heavy for you. You are not able to do it alone. Now obey my voice, I will give you advice, and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God, and you shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people, men who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. If you do this, God will direct you, and you will be able to endure, and all this people will also go to their place in peace. 
So Moses listened to the voice of his father-in-law and did all he had said. Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, chiefs of thousands, of hundreds, of fifties, of tens, and they judged the people at all times. Any hard case they brought to Moses, but any small matter, they decided themselves. Moses was doing too much and not getting help from those around him who uh, were capable of actually helping him. Jethro says to him, very bluntly and boldly, what you are doing is not good. I think that is about as plain as it can get. And I don't know any father-in-law that would probably be this direct or unafraid to speak his mind, but uh, it's definitely something that uh, Moses needed to hear in the time. Jethro wisely tells him that he can't continue to do everything on his own. He needs help, and he needs to bring the people in around him that are actually able to provide that help. So first, Moses had to decide to actually accept Jethro's advice and uh, take it. Then his actions had to reflect bringing in that advice into his heart and into his actions so that he could lead the people of God in a more sustainable way. So what now? What does this mean for us? We need to humble ourselves. And I know you can probably see a a theme of some of these things running through as, as we go through. Humility is a big part of this. Realizing that you can't do it all on your own. It's kind of funny to, to humble yourself and then bring others in. So, uh, you have to realize that you're not You're probably strong enough to to struggle through, but you're not going to be as good, and you're not going to be as effective, and it's not God's plan for you to do that. Next, we have to surround ourselves with people that are capable and willing to help us. We're filled with a building of people that, well, we can bring in on anything that we need help with, and they are more than happy to help us with that. And then the hardest part is we actually have to listen to the advice that these people give us. And we have to take that advice and maybe it's not something we wanted to hear. Maybe it's not something we wanted to do. But we have to, again, humble ourselves and take that advice and actually apply it. The last thing I have on here from what we can learn from Acts 1 is to lean on God through prayer. In verse 24 of Acts 1, we see that they pray to God for help in this decision. James 1, verses 5 and 6 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who give generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7 says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We learn from these verses that God is ready and able to help us. We need to go to him in prayer, and we can be sure that God will actually answer those prayers when we go to him faithfully. When there's a decision to be made, we should make God a part of that decision. The example I have for this comes from Genesis 24. This is the account of um, Abraham's servant going and choosing a wife for Isaac, his son. I'm going to read verses 10 through 21. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, my God, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master." Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance and a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my lord. 
And she quickly let down her jar upon her head and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. He wants to make sure that he makes the right choice for Abraham and for Isaac, his son. This is a pretty big choice on who to marry and who to carry the lineage through. So he prays to God. He brings God into that decision. And just like we're told in the verses that I read previously, God provided a clear choice and he helped the servant. And I, I like the end of this where it says he gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. And God literally does exactly what he asks. And he's like, is that really what it is? Uh, but it's, it's just funny to me. So what now? Well, of course, like they did in Acts 1 and the way they made the decision, we should cast lots. That's what we do now. Um, not really. We're probably not going to do that, but that is how they made the decision in this case. Um, but the philosophy behind it holds true. We need to pray to God and lean on him when making decisions in our life. We can't rely on our knowledge, on just us. We have to humble ourselves and get rid of our pride and go to God and let him direct our lives. And then we have to trust that God is in control. His will is going to be done regardless of the choice that we make. There's no choice that we can make or no decision that we can do that we will keep God's will from being done. Uh, we're, we're not that powerful and we're not that great despite sometimes thinking that. So we need to take action, gain knowledge, bring others in, and lean on God through prayer when making our decisions. And one of the biggest decisions we can make is whether or not to dedicate our life to Christ. If you aren't a Christian, the decision to die to yourself and be baptized is one that has eternal consequences. It's not one that you want to put off for another day. If you aren't ready for that, you should constantly be asking yourself, what do I need to do to become ready? And you need to be doing those things every single day until you're ready to make that decision. If you are already a Christian, you know the decision to dedicate your life to Christ isn't one that you make once, but it's one that you make every single day. And maybe you haven't been doing a great job of that. So if you need the help of the congregation in any way, or if uh, you would like to be baptized tonight, please come forward as we stand and as we sing. Mm -hmm.